Four for the fifth. Four radio programs for the fifth war loan produced by Arch Obler and William N. Robeson for the United States Treasury. <laughs> And starring on this broadcast, Mr. Fred McMurray. This is a war not only of men and machines, but of ideas. As the third of this special series of broadcasts about the ideas for which we fight and those which we must fight against, we bring you the play The Laughter, written and directed by Arch Obler and starring Mr. Fred McMurray. President, my name is Don Williams, Staff Sergeant Don Williams, and I want to tell you what happened to me when I was home on leave, home because I got a little bunged up on that beachhead. I know, so many things are happening, big important things, but I think you should know about this, this happened to me in the last few days. Maybe it's important too. Maybe it's happened to other people and they couldn't understand it. And maybe hearing about this, they'll understand what happened to them. It started just after dinner, a couple of days ago. It was one of Ma's better dinners when she puts her whole heart kind in it because it's a special occasion. Well, it was special, uh, very. You see, Jean, she's my, uh, she's my friend, was getting inducted into the wax in the morning. And, and this was Ma and me and the rest of the family giving her kind of a send-off. Now, quiet. Everybody, quiet. You listen to me, Jean. Yeah? When they put you on the kitchen police, you tell them for me that I said you weren't to wipe any dishes. Or inside of a week, the army won't have a dish or a plate or a cup to its name. Oh, wow. Oh, oh, that was all right, having fun. Jean could take anything that Ma or my 4F brother Mike or my sister Laura could dish out to her. And, and the laughing kind of made us forget that, that she was going away in the morning. And that soon I'd be gone again. But what happened next wasn't so funny. It started out all right, just my brother Mike playing the horses again, in a way. Now, wait a minute. I, wait a minute. I'm telling you, it was all over the plant yesterday. The big shot gambler's offering one to five that it's curtains for those Nazis in 60 days. Well, You hear that, Don? You won't even have time to knit Jean that sweater. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Pretty good news, huh? Sure is. Yes, but, uh, Mike, Hmm? uh, how in the world did they know that's true? Ma, don't you read the papers or listen to the radio? Look how the invasion went. Well, they took three more objectives. Oh, it was really six. Three. Six, I heard it on the radio, six. Now, don't fight, children. Hey, John. Who's right? Don't ask me. I'm home on leave. Well, well, anyway, we got him on the run, and that's a fact. Sure, I know, Mr. President. Nothing out of the way or funny there. Just people sitting around and feeling good because we've had some awfully good news. Nothing wrong there. Well, I say it was 22 miles. Oh, now stop arguing, too. Well, I say it was 26. Okay, okay, 22, 23, 26. We got them on the run, Ma. Yeah, and now that we've invaded. What do you mean, invaded? We took over. So there you are. Germans fighting on all those fronts. The Japs are on the run, and our side's marching. So it's in the bag. It's in the bag. <laughs> Mr. President, my brother said it's in the bag. It's in the bag. And all at once, something funny in my ears. I didn't know what, just a just a funny sound. Yeah, but I figured I'd get in 
Don, what is it? What's the matter, dear? Jean. Jean, do you do you hear anything funny? Yeah, of course. You do? Yeah, your brother Mike yeah. listened to so him. So I says to the guy, I says, okay. Okay, I'll take ten bucks of that bet on credit. Now, Mike, you're fooling. You didn't bet any money. But I told you, Ma, on credit. That ain't money. Oh. On credit, you know. <laughs> Try and collect. <laughs> But that funny sound I just heard, it was still in my ears. I could still hear it. I looked around the room. Ma was talking, and then, as usual, Mike talking. My sister, Laura, and Jean. But that sound I was hearing wasn't any of them. I thought, well, it's something from outside, something from out in the street. Make any difference to you or not? It does make a difference. No, it doesn't. It does. Everybody, war or no war, I'm going to bed. Oh, so early? Well, what's the matter, Ma? No matter at all. I'm tired. Anyway, maybe Don and Jean would like to be alone. Oh, oh sure. <laughs> Come on, Mike. I'll treat you to a movie. <laughs> okay. Go on, get your hat and coat. Sure, sure. I'll be right with you. They went away, and I was alone with Jean. I didn't think about anything then but Jean. But the next morning at the train... Hey, there. There she is in the last car. Yeah, yeah it's her, all right. <laughs> Jean. Hello, Jean. Jean. Hey, here's Don and me. Jean. Goodbye, baby. Goodbye, Jean. Goodbye, Goodbye honey. Hey, right. You were so open, you? We'll want to know all about it. Get something to eat on the train, Jean. Goodbye, baby. Oh, gee, Chris. Well, that's that. Uh, I gotta get to work. Don, I said I gotta get to work. Okay. Ah, oh, come on, Don. She'll be back soon. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, I won't be here. Don, for Pete's sake, what's the matter with you? Don't you know the war's gonna be over inside of two months? The second time, Mr. President. The minute she said that was when I heard that sound the second time. The station crowds with people talking and laughing and crying and, and the noise of trains, but, but over it all, that sound. Just a little sound, yet, yet so clear. And it was the same sound I'd heard the night before in our living room. Don, what's the matter with you? What are you listening to? I... I don't know, Laura. What do you mean you don't know? All at once your eyes pop and your mouth hangs open? What gives? I don't know. I... I really don't know. I drove Laura down to work. In fact, the south side of town. She'd worked there ever since she left school. I did, too, before I joined up. They made parts for automobiles and shipped them to Detroit. But now it's parts for planes. I went into the plant. I knew most of the girls and fellas. It was good to be there. I would stop thinking about... about what I'd heard. Don! Well, how's the part of the infantry? Hi, Barry. How do you feel? Wait till I turn this thing off. Your sister said you weren't feeling so good this morning. Oh? Why, uh, I, I'm fine. Yeah? How about a date now that Jean's gone? Well, I... I uh... Oh, come on. What's wrong with me? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I'm only kidding. You know, you shouldn't feel so bad about Jean. Why do you say that? Well, my dad says now that we're... I mean, you know, getting all those island bases, they'll bomb Japan out of the war inside of two months, and then Hitler will be on the run. Well, you know my brother Dan... Dad talked him into cashing in his war bonds and investing the cash in some... Oh, what's the matter? Did I say something wrong? Again. That sound again. Only louder this time. Scaring me. I I couldn't take it. I, I left the place. My head... Was something wrong with my head? Well, now, really, John, I don't find a thing constitutionally wrong with you. You've recovered completely from your injury. Eyes perfect, hearing perfect. As to those sounds you hear, presumably they're head noises. Since I find no physical defects, it follows that it's purely mental. 
due to perhaps uh, emotional trauma from battle fatigue. Yes, some sort of emotional trauma. The doctor's words, emotional, whatever it was, I, I got the idea. But he was wrong. That sound, I, I'd heard it. I knew I'd really heard it. By the time I got out of the doctor's office, it was lunch hour. Kate's lunchroom, a few blocks from the factory. My brother Mike and I, he was working in the paint shop at the plant. We always had lunch together at Kate's when I was home, so, so I went over there. John! Hey, John, back here! Hey, where you been? Oh, I, uh, I, I got tied up. Well, 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 sit down, sit down. All right, uh, for a minute. What do you mean, for a minute? Hey, Kate, what's for dessert? Lemon cream pie, bread pudding, and ice cream. Well, give me a hug of pie. Make it big enough so that I can see it, will you? One pie, coming up. Okay. What'll you have, Don? I'll sing it out or you'll never get waited on. I, uh, I, I don't want anything, Mike. You don't... What? I, I, I don't feel that I... I think I'm going to go home. Sure, sure. I know how it is. Jean going away and all that, but why go home? What? I'm taking the afternoon off, too. I tell you what I'll do. Seeing as you're down in the dumps, I'll treat you to a show. Oh, no, Mike, I, I couldn't... Come on, it. come on. It's on me. Do you good. Do you good. I went with him. Yes, to the movie. This is a house of death. Sudden, horrible death. Screwy picture, ain't it? I understand. Yeah, yeah. You, you must leave. Are you trying to frighten me? No. Warn you. Warn you. Darling, I love I go for these I mystery pictures, don't you? For me. Please, what time is it, Mike? Uh, no. Up as no, I... Two. I won't be frightened. Would you let me take you home? Now. Understand. Then come into the Mike. Huh? Do that, at least. I just thought. All right. How come they let you off? That's what well, didn't let me off. What? What do you think? You were there last night when I told you. Odds one to five, the war will be over in 60 days. So why should I break my neck working? Why should I break I go with my brother to a moving picture show. On the screen, the talking picture's talking. My brother's whispering to me and... And all of a sudden, that sound is in my ears again. That terrible sound, and, and I'm so scared I can't talk. I, I want to yell, but I can't. I, I get up out of the seat, and I run out of there, and Mike after me, and he wants to know what's the matter, and how could I tell him? What could I tell him? Sure, it's clear as day. Jean going away. How do you think the poor boy would feel? He'll be all right in a couple of days. My ma. When I got home, I, I heard her say that. That's the way she had it figured out. And that was last night. Ma brought my dinner to me. Yes. You just sit there and eat. Oh, really, Ma, I, I don't want it. Now, look. I don't want any trouble with you. Stop acting like a high school kid and eat. Here. Nice cup of hot tea. Look. I'm using the little teapot your Aunt Harriet gave us last Christmas. It's, uh, it's very pretty, Ma. Here. I toasted some cheese sandwiches. You eat and drink, and it'll be all right. All right, ma'am. Ah, sit down. Sure had a day. I wish they weren't coming over. Over? Yes, didn't I tell you? Mr. and Mrs. Mayon. I met her at the grocer's this morning, and so they're coming over after dinner. Gin rummy. You know how crazy he is about Jim Rummy. And you finish eating and rest a little bit, and when they come over, you come down and play some cards with us, Don. Do you good. You'll feel better. Stop. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Who's playing this man? You or me? Oh, come now, Mr. Mayon. Your wife is only giving you some good advice. But the more advice she gives me, the more points you win. Oh, would you listen to that man? I told him distinctly not to try for those queens, yeah. seeing as how a child knows that ten points is more than three points, oh. and those threes are what oh, adds up. Oh, for heaven's sake. Oh, hello, Don. Hello. 
How are you feeling? Mother said you were resting. Oh, will you look at that man in his uniform. I wish I was younger. Oh, do you now? Hello, Mrs. Mann. Mr. Mann. Well, how about you and me going dancing now that Jean's gone? Anna. <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah. Any oh. night, Mrs. Mann. Till my leaves up. Uh-huh. You hear that, Fred? Well, he's just polite. Always oh, that so. Here, you sit by me, Don. Maybe you'll bring me a little luck. Oh, you don't need any luck. You need a new hand. Oh, no, for heaven's sake, <laughs> Look, Don, look. Three games I've won from this expert. <laughs> oh, I'm just warming up. Oh, yeah. Now that Don's sitting next to me, watch my steam. Come on, deal the card. I sat there. Mr. and Mrs. Mann known them ever since I was just a little kid. It was good to be among people that you knew, safe and sure. The strange sounds I'd been hearing, now it was good to be with them. The way I said, safe and sure. And then my brother Mike came home. How do you feel tonight, Don? Okay. Uh, How do you like this guy? I treat him to a movie and he runs out of me. Now leave him alone, Mike. Oh, I'm only kidding. Yeah. Hey, how about dealing me in? Oh, no. Oh, no. I've got to have revenge on your mother yet before this <laughs> evening's over. And this time, I'm dealing first. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, at least I'll give it. No, no, no. Look, Mike. Now, why don't you get another deck of cards and play with my wife like a good boy? Oh, no, no. We'd rather sit here and watch the expert, wouldn't we, Michael? Sure, sure. <laughs> That's enough shuffling. Deal him up. Oh, sure, don't rub his spots off of them. Hey, you uh, feel okay, huh? Don? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Lord. Oh, look, look, look. What a hand. Well, you can take the first one, Mrs. Clark. I don't want it. I do. Hmm? <sighs> well, Michael? What do you think of the war news? I like it fine. Won't be long now. Michael says it'll be over in 60 days. Oh, not that soon. No? I should say in 90. 90? How do you figure that? Well, the Japs will take a little longer, but the European thing will be over by then. Oh, no, not oh. Johnny. They began talking about the war again. And suddenly I, I was afraid. Because... Because suddenly I remembered that it was only when I'd been listening to people talk about the war like that that I heard that sound. And now they were talking about those things, and, and I waited for it. But it didn't happen. I know, but I don't care what you say. Oh, no, you, you make disagree it... disagree with me if you want to. But my money's still one to five if the Nazis will fold up in 60 days. From the inside, mind you. From the inside. And about time, too. If it kept up any longer, we'd all be standing in the bread line. Oh, it's not quite as bad as all that, is it? Well... I'm a man who likes to keep his money. Oh, now, don't go off on that, Fred. And why shouldn't I? We'll win this war a heck of a lot faster than those politicians say we will. Watch your cards. I think you're right, Mr. Mann. Well, I'm dead right. And there's a way to stop all these high taxes and rationing and sacrifices we've had to endure. Well, oh, how's that? By giving up the idea that we've got to march right across the whole of Germany. Yes, sir. There's one certain way to end the war mighty quick. And that is to talk to the businessmen of Germany. Not to Hitler, but to the businessmen. Hey, that's an idea. Oh, there. don't encourage him. He'll talk all night. Oh. Don, what is it? Not feeling well again? I'm, uh, I'm all right. You know, Mike, what you said before, it's right. Now that we've really started in on the Germans... I've got a notion that they're all ready to fold up like a tire without air in it. Sure, that's common sense. They know their lick bar production. Yes, sir. So why not make a deal now? Say to the businessmen, let's make a deal, let's call it off before your whole investment shot to pieces. But isn't that just what the German general staff wants? So what? 50-50. Take and give. Get the home, get the boys home before Christmas. I don't know much about these things, but... Like they say, uh, wouldn't that mean another war in 20 years? Ah, rumors. Propaganda. I say throw Hitler out. Mm. Give the good Germans a chance. But who's got the right to judge the good Germans? You? I? Well, uh, How about the millions who suffered twice in a couple of generations at the hands of the Germans? How about the Czechs, the Russians, the Poles, and the French? And our own dead soldiers who fought to win a final victory. Not a patched up compromise. Hey, will you listen to that guy talk? Well, Don, uh, you're in uniform and I'm not. Too old, of course. 
But that very fact means that I've lived longer than you have. I've studied these things out. Common sense. I say make a deal. Why keep on spending millions and billions when the Germans know they licked right now? Yeah, the way them flying fortresses are bombing the German factories, I hear we're out producing them already, four to one. Yeah. They can't get the Czechs or the Belgians or anyone else to work for them. And if they do work, they ruin more than they make. But it did happen. Then, just then, that sound in my head and it was louder and louder and I couldn't tell what. Then suddenly I did. I knew what it was. Laughter. Terrible laughter. I, I covered my ears, but it wasn't in my head. It was it was in the room, filling the room. Louder and louder. And, and they, my brother and my mother and those people, they weren't hearing it. They just kept on talking. Louder and louder. Terrible laughter. I, I couldn't stand it. I, I cried out. No! Don. What is it? Well, what, Don? What's the matter? What cried out. Don, why? Well, why? Why did you cry out? What was it, Don? Tell us. Then I was up in my room. The door locked, and they, with all their questions, were gone. I lay there on the bed. Moments, hours, I don't know. All I knew then was that what I'd been hearing since the day before had been crazy laughing. And no one else was hearing it. Only I. And I didn't know why. I didn't know why. After a while, lying there, I, I couldn't take it anymore. My head going round and round. I, I didn't want to be alone, and I didn't want to go down there to them because their questions would... I reached over the, the radio. I turned on the radio and listened to something. Anything to drown out what I was thinking. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, for weeks I have spoken to you as one of that peculiar, omnipotent breed of people known as a radio commentator. What I have said to you, I have said with whatever wisdom or foolishness a man accumulates through years of study and experience. Tonight, on this radio hour, I have been asked to give you happy words, say something to you that would uplift your spirits, strengthen your morale. I cannot do so. I speak to you only in anger. This may be the last time I will be able to speak to you, but it must be in anger. Long before this conflict, I came to this country as a visitor. I chose to become a citizen. For I looked about me and I thought to myself that a people who could have such a great unity of purpose and build such a wonder out of a wilderness, this was a people without the, the terrible cancer of old world futility within them. This was a people with the strength within them to face the facts at any time of a changing world and find their fulfillment no matter what the cost. But tonight I am an angry, disillusioned man. For today, walking among some of you and listening to you, I have heard strange laughter. Laughter. Up to that moment, the voice on the radio had just been talking. I hadn't been listening. But now he had said strange laughter. Had he too? And why had I heard this laughter? Because there are some among you who have lived in fatness and ease so long that you have lost the hard realism that is America. In your fatness you have become fools. Someone else has won a few victories for you. Yes, not you, but someone else. And instead of a quiet pride in you and the strengthening of the will to continue to do what must be done to help those who fight for you. You stop working and you blow up your chest and your breath when it comes out is a bugle call of a victory already won. But who says it is won? The men who are fighting and dying for you even at this moment? No. They know this is not a war to be won on one battlefront at one time. It is a world war to be won back to freedom, bloody peace by bloody peace all over the world. Who is there among you who dares say, I know when this war will be won? Yes, it will be won. But to which one of you has God given the guarantee of victory? A few moments ago I said I heard laughter. Yes, all day strange laughter. For the enemy knows that you who stop working for victory to talk about a victory yet to be won, 
you who stop giving and who talk a conditioned peace when there can be no lasting peace on such terms are the same breed of fools who gave other nations to them. And so the enemy listens to you and laughs. For while you puff and blow and scheme for yourselves, they and their slaves work. Work for this war. Work for the next one they hope to make. To boast of a final victory before you have won it may be your way. But it is not your army or your navy's way. And I do not believe it is truly the American way. And then he stopped talking, Mr. President. And I turned off the radio and I lay there in the dark. And I wasn't mixed up anymore. I knew why I'd heard laughing while they had talked. My brother and my sister and my friends. But knowing, understanding, didn't make it any less frightening. For it's a terrible thing, isn't it? To sit in your own home. At your own table. Among your own family and friends. And hear... Hitler laughing. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard Mr. Fred McMurray in the play The Laughter. This program was written and directed by Arch Obler. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Gordon Jenkins. Included in the cast with Mr. McMurray were B. Benaderet, Gloria Blondell, Ken Christie, Verna Felton, Norma Field, Frank Graham, Joseph Granby, Catherine Lewis, Mercedes McCambridge, Lou Merrill, and Frank Martin. This has been the third of four special radio programs for the Fifth War Loan, produced by Arch Obler and William N. Robeson for the United States Treasury. Consult your local newspaper for the time of the next broadcast in this series, which will present the facts behind tonight's play in a stirring radio document by William N. Robeson entitled E-Day. Back the attack. By more than before.